Okay, I'm going to read a couple of kind of thoughts that the Lord kind of highlights me about emerging. I heard it's time to emerge and evolve, not the scientific evolution, but change. Like a caterpillar emerges and evolves into a butterfly, that kind of emergence and that kind of evolution. You cannot stay the same this year and go to where God has you, Jesus. Yes, God loves you where you are at, but love and destiny are not the same. Here's the thing. Moses never made it to the promised land. Yeah. Moses got stuck in caterpillar phase and never became that butterfly. God has the promised land for everybody. That's true. But not everybody will walk in. And that's a sad reality. It's like I've met people before that are 80 years old and they're dead and they didn't fill their promises. That's just the truth. I don't know. I feel like sometimes like, oh, here we go. K tangent here. But it's just like sometimes I feel like that preachers are just telling you that you're just going to get into the promised land just by being. That's not true. Okay, that preaches well on Sunday. Everyone gets all wrapped up. Yeah, of course I'm going to get into the promised land. But Moses didn't and he saw the face of God. He was the leader of the Israelites, saw the face of God, but could not enter the promised land. Character issues. Character issues. Okay? Now, if you guys, you Bible scholars and people that know the story here, why did he not enter into the promised land? Because he told them to, God told him to speak to the rock and he hit the rock instead. Alright? He strike the rock. Disobedience sometimes can stop you from getting into the promised land. Now, thankfully, thankfully, unlike Moses, he was before Jesus. So if we've done those things, we can say, hey, there's a cross. Jesus, there's a cross. Like, forgive me. We can go backwards and fix things. Okay, so it's a little different now. But it's just like, I want to encourage you, don't be Moses. Don't be Moses and get stuck when you're even the leader. Because God is no respecter of persons. Okay? Just because you're in the front, just because you're the CEO, just because you're whatever, sometimes you can still get stuck. You can still not enter into your promised land just because you have something going on. But we see that he struggled with, I honestly think he had anger issues. That's honestly what I think. Because we see him kill an Egyptian for bullying an Israelite. This guy just straight up murders him. I'm like, you see some anger issues there. Instead of speaking, he strikes the rock in anger and he says, you fools. You know, whatever. And it's like, there's some anger issues there. Can anger stop you from getting into the promised land? Yikes. <laughs> but it's like, it's these little foxes that spoil the vineyard. You know, it's like, we're blaming so-and-so and so-and-so, -and -so, but maybe we just too angry to get to the promised land. You know, you kind of have to daily do a forgiveness check. You kind of daily have to do, okay, I'm going to let that go check. You know, and it, it's hard sometimes. I mean, sometimes people just do the craziest stuff, and you're like, mm, what? <laughs> if they do that one more time, you know. But it's just like you you don't want it to keep you stuck. You don't want it to keep you stuck from walking to promise like Jesus. See, I, I think it's interesting because he, he had the anointing. But he didn't have the character. You can have the anointing, but if you don't have the character, you might not get there. I don't think God's asking for perfection here, but I think sometimes we have to let certain things go to really get ahead. Jesus. You know, I think something else I felt like the Lord was talking about was stagnancy. Stagnancy. <clears throat> you know, when we become stagnant, we can be stuck as a worm. Jesus. Mm. And I feel like we really just need to declare, I'm not going to be a worm this year. I am going to be a butterfly. I'm not going to be a caterpillar this year. I'm going to be a butterfly. I'm not going to stay stagnant. I think anyone who's a leader of any kind, it doesn't matter, secular, home, anything. One thing you probably hate is stagnancy. You're like, why are we in the exact same place we were last year? That is so annoying to any leaders. If you're not a leader yet, and you feel that way, you probably are a leader. Because that's like our ticks. We're just like, why are we in the same place? Um, because leaders are advancers. You know, we are people that are supposed to go. What's next? What's next? We're going. We're doing the next thing. And so if you're annoyed that you're standing, you're probably a leader. Jesus. Um, mm. Jesus. 
It is in the hidden place that you become worthy to be a butterfly. Jesus. You know, it's in the hidden place that you start feeling a wing growing. You're like, man, I think, I think that I might have an idea. I think I, I think I might have a business idea. I think I might have a baby coming soon. I think I might have a husband coming soon. I think I might have a church plan. You start thinking these things in the hidden place. You start feeling a wing growing. And you think, maybe I can fly. But then fear starts pushing you back again. Jesus. And I was like, Lord, what are we supposed to do about this? Because I feel like he said there's many people that feel stuck in a cocoon. Jesus. And, and the Lord said to me, the presence breaks the cocoon. The presence breaks the cocoon. Jesus, if you can just get into his presence, you can come out. But that's the first thing the devil's going to distract you as you get up in the morning. It's going to be the kid is crying. It's going to be this phone call. It's going to be the sink is leaking. It is going to be something else. Okay? Because the devil doesn't want you to start out your day in the presence. Because the presence breaks the cocoon. Jesus. And that sink can just keep on leaking. Okay? Like, bye. <laughs> Jesus. Mm. Mm. Now, another thing I felt like he was talking about for this year was to be aware of things that aren't really butterflies. I was at my house, and I thought I saw a butterfly um, as I was preparing for the sermon. I thought I saw a butterfly, so I was like, oh, look, a butterfly. As I got closer, I realized it was a dragonfly. And, and the Lord started to speak to me about this, and he says, you know, at one glance, a dragonfly can look like a butterfly. They could look the same. But you got to look closer. you got to look closer because you don't want to fly with dragonflies. You want to fly with butterflies. You don't need something that's going to sting you. We don't need dragons, okay? We need other butterflies, Jesus. Because the truth of the matter is, when you become from this place of not being a worm anymore, you're going to want to fly, but then the worms are going to get mad. The worms are going to be like, hey, hey, hey. Where are you going? What What do you think you're doing? We over here crawling on the ground. Where are you? Who do you think you are? You just going to fly up there? Uh, uh, no? You're not going to hang out with us anymore? You're not going to sit here and smoke weed with us anymore? You're not going to sit here and watch TV for 10 hours with us anymore? You're not going to sit here and gossip about all the girls at church anymore? Ooh, it just got quiet in here. I'm a butterfly. I gotta go. Yeah. And you know, if people are really supposed to be with you, they'll go into a cocoon too. Yeah. And they'll come out a butterfly too. Because yeah. I don't have to sit here and go backwards because you won't transform. Yeah. Jesus. It is not my fault that you don't get into the presence of God. Yeah. You know, I know there's certain family members and stuff. You're like, okay, I'm stuck with them forever. And I get that. But that doesn't mean you have to hang out with them 24-7. Okay? You allow your time table. Okay? You have to set boundaries where you need to set boundaries so you can fly. You don't want to get stuck this year. Jesus. I felt like something else the Lord was talking about is we have to be fruit inspectors. We have to be fruit inspectors. Now, I think some of you know where I'm going with this, but I'm going to go a little bit deeper than anything I'm probably going to go. So... Obviously, we know the Bible says to judge a tree by its fruit. Most of us would know that verse, okay? However, I'm going to take it a little bit deeper. Just because a tree has fruit doesn't mean it's actual fruit. Right. Because sometimes there's plastic fruits. Yeah, you got a million followers on Instagram, but you got 20 likes. Someone's got some plastic fruit. Someone bought those people. Don't be acting like you, you're trying to take me somewhere you're not even at. Okay? It's like, we don't, we never bought any subscribers on YouTube. Our, that's real people. Those are real people. Yeah, we've waited. Maybe we've waited longer. Maybe we don't look as big as someone else, but my view count is bigger than yours, so something's wrong with your channel. Sorry. I'm not trying to be rude here, but it's like some people are faking their fruit to try to get you to come follow them, and that's not even real. we got 
gotta you gotta be aware. Okay? You wanna follow people that actually have fruit. You know, it's like, how many people have you saved? How many people have you delivered? How many people have you healed? You know, is the glory falling at your meetings? Like, you know, have you had successful businesses? Like, what? Like, is there truth to what you're saying? Or are you just full of plastic fruit? And sometimes people have some fruit. You know, they really do have some fruit, but the fruit has worms. Another thing you need to know is if you cut open a cocoon, the butterfly can die. Some of you are trying to get people to help you get out. And God said, mm -mm, you got to do this yourself. You don't like that. And I get it. I, I don't, I get it. You know? I think there's sometimes this, like, unspoken thing in the church, too. It's like, well, maybe if I just meet this famous minister, then I'll have a platform. Go build your own platform. Your platform is going to come by you helping people, not meeting a minister. Okay? And here's the thing. If you have to make certain connections, you might owe those people something. It's like, you want God to build your platform, so you don't owe nobody nothing. You can't tear down this platform. God built it. Jesus. Jesus. You know, in the struggle to get out of the cocoon, to fly, it's where you find who you really are. Because if someone just cuts you out, you would never know who you actually are. Amen. It's true. Because the thing is, you know, I think a lot of the way our ministry works, we've learned through the struggle. We've learned through our own processes, our own hardships, how our ministry is supposed to work. You know, you can't just be a cookie cutter of someone else's ministry or business or relationship. You, know, you can't go on Instagram and look at their marriage and be like, my marriage is going to be exactly like that. It's not. It's through the struggle you learn how your marriage is supposed to work. It's like, all right, they don't like that, never doing that again. You know, it's like you learn through the process. Just because so and so does that doesn't mean I need to do that. It's like, I don't know, I, I would assume me and Ryan's marriage doesn't look like everybody else's, and that's okay because it works for us. You know, it doesn't have to look like Instagram or reviews or whatever. It's just like you gotta find your own flow. Because it's through that place that the anointing really comes. You know, we don't need another Benny Hinn. We need you to show up. Yes. And so you just be you. And I think that's why, you know, the anointing is so much about relationship. It's not about copy. You know, it's about you, specifically you, doing what God told you to do, and then you get the breakthrough. It's not about you doing exactly what that minister did, and then you get the breakthrough. It's you finding your own wings. No, you can't jump on my butterfly back. You have to be your own butterfly. Okay? You have to find your own wings and fly. And we don't like that. Jesus. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to read some out of Jeremiah 38. Um, we're going to talk about Jeremiah preaching a word and then getting thrown in a well. Jesus. Um, all right. We're going to start at 38.2. I'm going to read a lot. I know it's annoying, but there's a point to it. So, um, Thus saith the Lord, he that remaineth in his city shall die by the sword. This is Jeremiah speaking of prophecy. Um, by the famine and by the pestilence. But he that goeth forth to the Chaldeans, oh God, shall live. I am, I am horrible pronouncing this, I'm sorry. Uh, shall live, for he shall have his life for a prey and shall live. Thus saith the Lord, the city shall surely be given into the hand of the king of Babel's army, which shall take it. So let's just stop right there. So Jeremiah is giving a prophecy. Um, you guys are screwed. Like, that's what he's basically saying. He's saying, you guys, you, you, it's not good for you. It's not good for you. And he's telling this to where the army is. Just imagine like the U.S. military, okay? Somebody comes in and is like, y'all going to lose. Y'all just going to lose. Can you imagine like the commander's story being, get that person out of here, get them out of there, don't speak negative over our army, don't speak anything negative, get them out of there right now. we got to have positive thoughts here, you know, get them out. That's what was happening. Okay, so Jeremiah was trying to speak the word of the Lord, and they were like, no, 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 we're not going to have this. We're going to win. But sometimes denial keeps you stuck. Sometimes you find battles, God told you, mm, if you go in there, you're going to lose. Do not go in there. You're like, the Lord is with me. The Lord's not with you. <laughs> he might be in you, but he's not with you. Okay? It doesn't mean the Holy Spirit jumped out of you if you fought about all of that you're not supposed to fight. But the Spirit of the Lord doesn't go before you then. 
And so now you just fight and fight and fight and you're exhausted and you're like, oh man, when's God going to show up? He's not going to show up. And that's hard for us to hear sometimes because I think because we're so conditioned to American culture where we're told we, we got every victory. We got every victory. And sometimes we don't have the victory. Sometimes we got to back up and say, this isn't my fight. It's better to be obedient than win a territory. It's better to say, you know, God told me not to fight these devils. I'm backing up. You know, because that keeps you safe. Okay, Jesus. All right, let's go into verse 4. Uh, Therefore the princess said to the king, We beseech you, let this man be put to death. I mean, it's a little dramatic. For thus he has weakened the hands. And this is so interesting, because like he didn't actually weaken their hands, but just by him speaking, he said they didn't want to fight anymore. So this is where the princes are saying, they don't, they don't want to fight anymore. We get the hands of the men of war that remain in the city and the hands of all the people and speaking such words on them. For this man seeketh not the wealth of his people, but the hurt. And, and I think that can often happen to us as prophets. You know, we're telling the truth, but people think that means that we're against them. And I'm like, I'm not against you, dude. Like, I'm just trying to tell it to you real. Because I, I actually am seeking your welfare. So we see here that Jeremiah is accused of not caring about the people because he spoke a true word. Right. Jesus. Okay, number five, or verse five. Then Zedekiah, the king, said, Behold, he is in your hands, for the king can deny you nothing. Um, this guy is just a pushover king. Um, then took they Jeremiah and cast him into the dungeon. Um, that was in the court of the prison. And so the version, different versions say um, prison, some say dungeon, some say well. For the sake of the sermon, I'm going to use well because I think that's the one the Holy Spirit was highlighting to me. Um, so he was cast into the well and let down with cords because I'm like, that kind of makes sense going down to a well. Um, and they let down Jeremiah with cords. In the well, there was no water. Sometimes you are in a well, ladies, because you are actually obedient to the Lord. Sometimes you are repenting your brain out. You're like, you're repenting of something you did 20 years ago, hoping that that will give you a breakthrough. And it's like, no, 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 you're in the well because of obedience. And that's hard for us to hear sometimes because we're like, but God, I listened to you. And he's like, I know. And you're like, so why I'm in the well? Because you were obedient. We don't like that answer. Jesus. Jesus. And the worst thing is not only is he in a well, but he's in a well with no water. And I think many of you, I felt like the Lord was saying, you feel like you're in a place with no water. You feel like you just can't get a break. You're like, I just need to be refreshed. I just need a sip of water. I just need to breathe. And you just can't because you're stuck in a well because you listen to the Lord. Jesus. And not only did he have no water, but there he is in the mire. It says, Jeremiah was stuck us. This is verse 6 in the mire. He was stuck. So here we see a prophet. He's just stuck in the mire. He's just stuck in the mire. He's, there's no water. And Jeremiah is about to die for being obedient. And I think we can often feel that way when we're obedient to the Lord. We're like, man, God. And, and, and it makes us question and stuff. God, did I really hear you? Did you really say that? Did you really tell me to talk to that person? Did you really tell me to sign that contract? Did you really tell me to move? Did you really, oh, I feel that Lord. Did you really tell me to move? Did you really tell me to do that business deal? Did you really tell me to make that connection with that friend? And you're sitting there and you're like, but I have no water. I'm stuck. But I listen to you. Jesus. Mm. But God is sending you the more, Jesus. Verse 7. Now when ebed Malak, the black moor, one of the eunuchs, which was in the king's house, heard that they had put Jeremiah in the dungeon, then the king sat in the gate of Benjamin, and ebed Malak went out to the king's house and spoke to the kings, My lord, these men have done evil in all that they have done to Jeremiah the prophet, whom they have cast in the dungeon of Jesus. And he dieth for hunger in the place where he is, for there is no more bread in the city, and also he was not eating, Jesus. He's got no food. He's alone. There's no water, and he's stuck in the mire. Jesus. Then, the, But then things were going to start to turn around. Jesus. A black moor just that happened to work for the king said, you know what? This ain't right. The way you're treating this guy, he's some kind of holy guy, some kind of prophet guy. This is not right. You need to get this guy out of there. And I felt like the Lord is saying, he's saying your evil is coming. 
Jesus. God is sending you somebody or something to get you out of this because you were obedient to the Lord. That is why you are stuck. Jesus. Sometimes we think it's repentance. It's not repentance. It's because you're obedient. You know, that's the real cross that we carry. Jesus was persecuted, though he followed the Holy Spirit. Okay? We can't live in denial that persecutions will come, but we do know the one who leads us out of the persecutions. Then the king commanded even Malach the black Moor, saying, Take from his thirty men with thee, and take Jeremiah the prophet out of the well before he dies. So this guy's about to die. And I think some of you might feel like you're about to emotionally die right now. Jesus. But God is sending you even, Jesus. And he took the men with him because you are supposed to emerge, Jesus. And he went to the house of the king under the treasury and took their old rotten rags and old cloths and let them down. And the Lord is saying, take your rotten rags and your cloths and get up. Stop the car, 
and go get the trash bag. I'm like, this, it's like, it wasn't like, it's sitting on someone's driveway, y'all. It's like sitting on someone's driveway, and I'm like, oh, like, I don't really want to do this. And Laura's like, you know, go no. <laughs> I'm like, uh, can you, like, please, like, stop the car and let me get that trash bag in the <laughs>